What up, people? Today we're going to take a look at James K. Polk's administration and the idea of manifest destiny. And important to keep in mind is when Polk wins the presidency in 1844 as the Democratic candidate, he's a dark horse candidate, comes out of nowhere, beats the Whig, Henry Clay. He has a couple of goals, and they're really simple. One, he wants to lower the tariff. Two, he wants to expand the boundaries of the United States, this idea of manifest destiny. And three, he has some areas that he's looking at. These are the areas that, in his mind, are America's destiny to acquire. My destiny. Oregon, the annexation of Texas, and the acquisition of California. We're going to deal with the first two in today's lecture. Now... What is manifest destiny? And it's this idea that, you know, you can kind of see in this painting uh, called American Progress, uh, painted, I believe, in like the 1870s. And the concept is simple. It is America's destiny. You were always meant to be my destiny. The continent was always meant for us. It's this belief that God wanted the American people to occupy the entire continent. And the idea of manifest destiny, uh, where we're going to spread civilization, democracy, and all these American ideals, uh, gets coined in 1845 by a guy by the name of John O'Sullivan. But this idea of expansion is not just something that happens in the 1840s and 1850s. America's been expanding. We saw the Louisiana Purchase in 1803. We saw the Indian Removal Act so that Southerners can get that land that the five civilized tribes had uh, occupied for centuries. And what ends up happening is in the 1840s and under James K. Polk, it actually gets uh, articulated and pursued in a way like never before. In fact, the first area that Polk has in mind is Oregon. Not only are we going to New Hampshire, we're going to South Carolina and Oklahoma and Oregon. Yeah! Oregon. And if you recall, the Anglo-American Convention was signed between the United States and England in 1818. And basically, we said with England, hey, we're going to peacefully, jointly occupy Oregon Territory. We're going we're to share this thing. And important to keep in mind as well is Oregon Territory was at one time or another claimed by Spain, Russia, England, and the U.S. And really, it was way far away, but America had interest in it. Now, of any of these powers or these countries that had claimed it, England's probably was the strongest claim. They had been there for a very long time, especially north of the Columbia River. They had discovered and explored it more so than most of the other countries. They actually occupied it, and they had a colonizing agency called the Hudson Bay Company, which had been operating in that region for years. But England has a problem. They're really, really far away from Oregon, so they have difficulties sending settlers over to this territory. And the United States and American settlers start flooding into Oregon in the 1820s and the 1830s along the Oregon Trail. I'm gonna hit that Oregon Trail that's coming fall. Hit that Oregon Trail that's coming fall. And really, it's Methodist missionaries who are the first Americans to kind of come to the region. Methodist missionaries stimulate interest in this faraway territory. And along the Oregon Trail, which is 2,000, over 2,000 mile journey, other Americans, fur traders, and other settlers start coming into the region. And pretty soon, you have way more American settlers than you have British settlers in Oregon Territory. It's something like by the 1840s, like 5,000 Americans and about 700 British settlers. So during the campaign of 1844, Oregon becomes an issue. In fact, during the campaign, Polk said 54-40 or fight, meaning the United States is going to get the boundaries of Oregon all the way up to here. That's the land we're going to take. And if you don't give it to us, England, we're going to fight now, what ends up happening is Oregon, you know, it's not a big priority for the British Empire. And what ends up occurring is compromise and eventually the Oregon Treaty, which says, so long, farewell, oh, we We're going to leave. And basically, England gives up claims to Oregon territory. They divide it not at 5440, but at the 49th parallel you see right here. 
There's no war needed, no blood spilled. But one thing England does get is access to Vancouver Island for fishing and other resource purposes. So the Oregon situation is resolved and Polk adds a big chunk of land to American territory. Now the area that Polk was really interested first priority was not Oregon, it was Texas. And a little historical context for you, if you recall, Texas had become an independent republic following the Texas Revolution as Sam Houston becomes the first president of Texas in 1836. And according to Mexico and the leader Santa Ana, they reject this. You are not an independent country. In fact, Santa Ana says Texas is still part of Mexico. Now, as a result of this kind of dispute, uh, the United States really needs to figure out what is our policy going to be towards this new nation, the Lone Star Republic. And Jackson, very quickly, following Texas independence, says, hey, homie, we down with you. And he recognizes the Republic of Texas uh, in 1837. Now, while he recognizes the Republic of Texas, Texas wanted to go a little step further. They wanted the United States to annex them. But the United States doesn't do this because of the issue, the contentious issue of slavery. Northerners are, like, adamantly opposed to Texas becoming a part of the United States. Because there's a fear that if Texas joins the Union, it's going to turn into as many as five southern slave states. So Jackson does not annex Texas. Martin Van Buren, the president after him, does not annex Texas. But Texas is in a difficult situation because they are fearful that Mexico will try to reconquer them. So they have to maintain a very costly military presence. So they start looking for friends. And there's a fear that they are going to join England in a defensive alliance at the very least, or perhaps even something more. Maybe England will take over Texas. And English merchants are just loving the idea of having a relationship with Texas because Texas is very good soil to grow cotton. And British merchants would love to have free trade in this area. You know, there would be no tariffs if it's not a part of the United States. So they start flirting with Texas, and America's a little concerned. Well, in 1844, the issue of Texas pops up in national politics. And up until 1844, from 1836 to 1844, Texas is a political hot potato. No one wants to hold the issue. It's just, it's very divisive. No one wants to deal with it. But James K. Polk, turns it into a major issue and he openly claims, openly proposes that the Lone Star Republic, Texas, should be annexed by the United States. And he really runs on this issue and a couple others, but Texas is key to America's expansion. Now Polk is elected in 1844, he wins the presidency as we know, but before he takes office, the guy who's in power, John Tyler, the guy who ran with William Henry Harrison tries one more time to get this issue of Texas uh, approved. He had tried once before and it was rejected by mainly Northerners, especially Whigs in the Senate, but he sees the election of Polk as proof that the nation will support it, and he doesn't go for the two-thirds required to get it approved. He just gets a majority and Lame duck president John Tyler submits the proposal and Congress annexes Texas. Polk's going to take office. The issue's not going to be over with because in the next lecture we're going to take a look at the United States and Mexico going to war. Check it out. Until next time, thank you for watching. If you haven't subscribed, do so. Click like, tell a friend. Peace.